We're going to talk today about the importance of prayer and seven reasons why we should pray. But before we do, we're going to just meditate on the Lord with this song of worship, listen to the words, and agree with the psalmist. Lord, make me a house of prayer. Make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. A house of prayer. The fire on my altar never burn out. The fire on my altar never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. the fire on my altar never burn out. The fire on my altar never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer, Lord, make me a house, make me a house of prayer. I want to seek your face, seek your face, Lord, make me a house, make me a house of prayer, a house of prayer. May the fire of my altar never burn out. May the fire of my altar never burn out. May the fire of my altar never burn out. Make me a house of bread. May the fire of my altar never burn out. The fire of my altar never burn out. May the fire of my altar never burn out. Make me a house of bread. We say, Lord, make me a house. Oh, make me a house of bread. I want to seek your face. Seek your face, Lord. Make me a house. Make me a house of bread. A house of bread. May the fire of my altar never burn out. May the fire of my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. Praise the Lord. May the fire of my altar never, ever burn out. I'm, re I'm doing this lesson today because what I've noticed during this time of trials and tribulations uh, during this pandemic that we are in is that many of God's people need to relight their fire on that altar, that fire that came when they repented of their sins, that fire that prompts prayer and intercession. I believe that this is the hour, and this is why God has pulled his church away to himself. We have nothing else to depend on. We have no church. We can't run to the sanctuary and say, oh, I go to church, and so therefore I'm okay. We can't uh, run to the job and keep ourselves busy in our daily tasks and our daily duties. We can hardly get out and do good works because of the lockdown of this pandemic. So we don't have even that to say, oh, I'm doing good deeds for God, so I'm okay. No, God has caused each and every one of us to come aside to him and to be alone with him, to be in our homes, uh, with our families, to be in our homes, some of us alone. But God has called us aside so that we can rekindle that fire that was once lit for him. I believe that today. And so I want to talk to you today about seven reasons to pray. Seven reasons to pray. The first thing I want to bring out is that Jesus was our example in prayer. And some might say, well, why should we pray? Why? What is the cause? What is the reason? 
And some may be reluctant to pray because you're praying to a God you cannot see. You're praying to a God that you only believe in and you see no physical evidence that he is real. But I want to tell you that God is real today. So why should you pray? Well, in Luke, the fifth chapter and the 15th through 16th verse, it says, but so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, talking about Jesus. Great multitudes came together to hear him and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Jesus was our example of prayer. And one other scripture he tells us, he said, men ought to always pray and not to faint. So here in Mark first chapter and the 35th verse, we read very early in the morning. Not only did he steal away from the crowd during the day, but early in the morning, he rose while it was still dark. Here in America, when it's still dark, it's what, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., even 5 a.m. in the morning. Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Luke 6 chapter and 12th verse also tells us, and it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. So we see that Jesus went out in the daytime to pray, he got up early in the morning to pray, and he even prayed all night. Some of us have all night prayer from like 10 a.m. or 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning. All night prayer, where we're calling on the face, uh, uh, calling on the Lord and calling on his name. So let's look at how and why Jesus prayed. After all, he got more answers to prayers than many of us today. He also, he always prayed for the right reason. First, because he prayed all the time. Jesus didn't pray for his own selfish motives. He had no other agenda. He wasn't on earth to gain houses, cars, and land. He wasn't looking for a wife. <laughs> and he was here to pray and to do the will of God. The Bible says that he would often withdraw to the wilderness and pray. Often is right. He prayed just about every chance he got. He was perfect. So it wasn't like he was praying for forgiveness of sin or anything like that. So what was he praying? I believe he was praying for the power and the anointing and the purpose and will of God. So let's go over those seven reasons to pray. Number one, and if you have your pen and paper, I suggest you write these down. Number one reason to pray is to build our relationship with Jesus. My goodness, we become Christians when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, for he died for us and he lives in us. And so when we pray, we are talking to the Father. The Bible says that the way we ought to pray when the disciples asked Jesus, they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus taught them uh, the model prayer. And he said, our Father, some say Abba, Father, which art in heaven, hallowed, mean holy. We reverence your name. Hallowed be thy name. We come before the presence of God, first giving him praise and, and reverencing his holy name. Holy and reverent be your name. And then the prayer goes on to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You see, Jesus wasn't seeking his own will. He was seeking the will of the Father. He said when he was 12 years old, when his mother and father were looking for him, when he uh, became left in the crowd and he, was, he stayed back to talk to the scribes and the Pharisees, he said, why do you look for me? Don't you know that I have to be about my father's business? So that was number one. That was paramount in the life of Jesus, 
was to be about his father's business. But for us, to pray builds our relationship. It's just like a friendship or any other relationship. Anytime you want to formulate a relationship with someone, you want to get to know them. And in order to get to know them, you spend time with them. Whether it be on the phone or whether it be in person, you spend time with that individual. God is just the same as we. He's no different. God has given us his attributes. He's given us his emotions of joy, of laughter. I do believe. And God has given us his attribute of love and connectivity, that we would be connected with those that we love, with God being the first one. The Bible says for the Ten Commandments, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and have no other gods before me. So we see that God is a God of love. And not only does he want to uh, pour out his love, but he wants to be, he wants love to be reciprocated back to him. And so that's one of the essential points and purposes for prayer, to build our relationship with Jesus. And so 1 Peter, the fifth chapter and the seventh verse, Paul admonishes believers to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. Let me get that scripture, and we're going to just read it so that you can hear uh, what it says. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. And it says, I'm going to go up to verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. To humble ourselves means to, to, to come in humility and to come knowing that we are nothing without God. We need him. If a person is not humble, that person is relying on their own strength and their own ability, and they're boasting about it. But a humble person will call on the name of the Lord, pray to God for help and for strength in times of trouble. And not just in times of trouble, but every day, because that person that is humble knows that they need God. That was one of the attributes of King David. King David was a man considered after God's own heart. But David prayed. Every uh, chapter in the book of Psalms was written by David, and it was a prayer. It was a prayer that David prayed to God. We can see many a times where David was distressed, he was fearful, he was afraid, but before the end of that prayer, David was confessing his faith and his confidence in God. And God came through every time for him because he humbled himself. He was a man of prayer. So the scripture says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Then it says, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. You see, a person who doesn't trust that God cares for them, they'll never pray. A person who doesn't really believe God exists, they'll never pray. But the Bible tells us to, to, to come boldly before the throne of grace, that we might find help to, in the time of need. We might find grace and mercy. And it tells us that he that believeth in God, uh, he that cometh unto God, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So a humble person will diligently seek the Lord, and they will believe that God is a rewarder. So they will believe that their prayers are not in vain, and therefore they can pour out their heart unto God, and he will sustain them. So the first step, building our relationship with Jesus. So as we approach problems, 
we bring them to the Lord. As we get up in the morning, we want to get to know him. We spend time praising him and adoring him and reading his word and learning more about him and being quiet and listening for his still small voice to tell us sometimes that he loves us or to encourage our hearts to know that he's with us. Many of times, God has revealed himself to me in those quiet moments of prayer. Number two, it helps us overcome temptation. Let's go and look at some of the scriptures that uh, the Lord gave us about temptation. In the book of Luke and the 22nd chapter, let's go there. The book of Luke chapter 22. And we're going to go down to the 39th verse. All right. All right. And it says, and he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that you enter not into temptation. Now, when we read this, uh, scripture, we see how um, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew that his hour was approaching, and he asked the disciples to pray. Could they just pray one hour with him? And the disciples fell asleep, and they failed to pray. But Jesus knew the temptation that was coming. There was a temptation to to cut off a soldier's ear. And Peter fell into temptation because he failed to pray. So when we read further down in the 42nd verse, we see that Jesus saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So we see even Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane to uh, relieve himself of temptation, the temptation of his own flesh not wanting to die on the cross. He prayed. However, if you continue on reading all the way through the end of that chapter, you will see what Peter did, and Peter fell into temptation. The other disciples fell into temptation, and they abandoned Jesus at his most crucial moment. That is number two. You pray so that you will overcome temptation. Number three, prayer helps us determine God's will. Ha, isn't that amazing? It is important that we determine God's will for our lives. And sometimes through prayer, God reveals his will to our spirit man. We began to feel a sense of urgency to go in a certain direction or to do a certain thing because prayer opens our spirit to God so that his will can be done in our lives. But it's only when we submit to that will. Some people pray out of ritual or out of duty and they never really submit to the will of God. But God is looking for his church in this hour to steal away with him, to pray, and to submit themselves to the will of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 becomes alive to us, and it says this, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Here, we remove selfishness when we pray. We submit to God's will, which always carries sound judgment. So in order to fulfill God's will, we must humble ourselves. Philippians 2 and 8, Jesus humbled himself, the Bible says, and became obedient even unto the death of the cross. So that, in essence, as we started out talking about humility, is the number one element necessary for prayer humility, and repentance. We're going to look at a chart here today 
about repentance, the importance of repentance for a child of God. Here we see repentance being the first step to the plan of salvation. To experience sorrow and conviction over past sins. That's what repentance does. And a turning away from future sins. John the Baptist preached repentance. And we can find it in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2. Let's go there. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2. In those days, I'm going to go up to verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judah and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we see that the first step to pleasing God is in repentance. And to repent, uh, in the process of repenting, you pray. As you can see, this man on the screen uh, is kneeling down to pray and ask for God's forgiveness. I often tell people who judge individuals that were you in their house last night? You don't know whether that person got on their knees and repented to God and asked God to forgive them of their past sins and to empower them and help them. We don't know. But what we do know is that when God's repentance works in a person, it causes that person to turn away from those past sins and to live a new life. So prayer is the first step to repentance. And number three, as we mentioned, prayer helps us determine the will of God. Number four, prayer accomplishes God's work. You know, God told us that men ought to always pray and not to faint. God also told us that we should pray for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may live a quiet and a peaceable life. So God wants us to pray for all men because he wants them to be saved. And our prayers are heard by him. Isn't that amazing? And if someone told you to pray, and or, or look, God told us to pray. Here it is. God told us to pray and pray for all men. He didn't tell us to pray for them in vain. He didn't tell us just to pray to be praying. He told us to pray because he hears our prayers. Those that are born again, that have Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God on the inside of them. When you approach the throne of grace, God doesn't see you or any of your sins, but he sees his dear son. And whatever Jesus asked for, God gave it to him. So if we are submitted to the will of God, we have prayed, we continue to pray and resist temptation. We have built our relationship with God. We have become acquainted with him and he with us. You know, I have set several hours throughout the day to pray, especially in the mornings and even late at 12 midnight. And if I don't pray at those hours, I can feel the Spirit of God tugging at my spirit, calling me to pray. And, and when that happens, it lets me know that God has, he looks for me. He looks to talk to me, just like he looks to talk to you. He looks to talk to Adam when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. God was used to talking to Adam. In the cool of the day, Adam would talk with God. And all of a sudden, Adam stopped talking to God. And God said, Adam, where are you? As he walked through the cool of the day. I want you to just think about that for a minute. That just tells you just how loving and accepting God is to us. He's not trying to destroy you and I. He's trying to pull us away to him so that we can escape the judgment that is coming on this earth. God is going to judge this earth because first of all, it's operated by Satan. As Adam gave his authority over to Satan, the enemy, devil, the devil took over this earth. The 
prince of the air. He took over, not it's not his earth, but he took over mankind's um, actions and he, uh, he deceived them to do certain things in this earth, thinking that he would have a kingdom as great as God. That's why the Bible tells us that you and I are no, we're not citizens of this earth, but we're citizens of heaven. We're ambassadors of Christ. We're here, sent here, born of God, not born of man, but born of God, born of his word to do his will in the earth. But if you don't ever talk to your redeemer, if you don't ever talk to your maker, and if you don't ever formulate a relationship with him, then you are just a mere mortal walking around this earth and you are open prey for the enemy to destroy. That's why many people are depressed and despondent and fearful because they have no relationship. They have no prayer life with God. And God is using this time, I do believe, to call the church back to his side. It's just like a marriage that has gone stale. And here you have a husband, God the Father, that cares about the relationship. And so he says, well, come back to me. Just like Hosea, when he married Goma, the, 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 the adulteress or the harlot, the prostitute, whatever you want to call her. Every time he would pull her back to himself, she would venture off again and go be with her lovers. And Hosea would go and get her again, pull her back to himself and say, I don't care what you do, you're my wife. Well, that's what God is doing to the bride of Christ. He said, I don't care, you may have ventured off, but you belong to me. I want to pull you back to me. Come on, let's get to know each other. Let's, let's communicate. Let's get intimate again. Let me help you do your first works again. I believe that's what God is doing in this hour. What else does prayer do? Prayer is a weapon of spiritual warfare. Prayer, when you pray and declare the word of God, angels are going out on assignment. Your prayers are a weapon. And your prayers are heard in heaven. God hears your prayers and they are going up to him as a sweet incense. And prayers never die. That incense is forever going up. Whether you pray in the morning, whether you pray in the noonday, whether you pray in the evening, prayers are incense going up to the Father. And that incense never fades away. So prayer is uh, a weapon of spiritual warfare. The next one, prayer is valuable to God. I'm sorry, prayer is a prerequisite to spiritual awakening. You know, in order for our spirits to be awakened and in order for us to, our eyes to be open and our ears to be open, we must pray. Prayer is your spirit talking to God. And that is something that wakes that spirit up because our spirits were asleep. Our spirits were dead in sin and trespasses. But prayer wakes it up and gets it in connection with God the Father. Prayer is that spiritual awaking. Second Chronicles 7, 14 says, If my people that are called by my name, see here this word, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, and forgive their sins, and heal their land. The last one, prayer is valuable to God. It is valuable to God. In the book of Revelations, uh, the fifth chapter in the eighth verse, it tells us how that our prayers are going up to God as an incense. Our prayers go up to God as intercession, because we are interceding not only for ourselves, but for others. Prayer is so valuable that I believe when you pray, and especially when you pray in the Spirit, you are interceding for yourself. You are joining with Jesus to intercede for yourself. 
all of the things that you're going through, all of the hard times, all of the tribulations, all of those things, that intercessory prayer puts them up before God. And then God, in turn, gives you peace. That's why the scripture says, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. You see, prayer is our intimate relationship with God. Prayer causes us, rather, to have an intimate relationship with God. It gives us strength. It gives us wisdom. It gives us guidance when we pray. And most of all, we build ourselves up when we pray. The Bible says, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And it goes on, and that's in the book of Jude, verse um, 20. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And then it admonishes us to keep ourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So prayer, brothers and sisters, is vital. Prayer is vital to you and it's vital to God and it's vital to your fellow man. Because without the church praying, the world has no hope. And without the church praying, we have no intimacy with God. And without the church praying, we have no fellowship with him. So I encourage you today to get back to that place of prayer. Pray without ceasing. Pray to the Father who hears and answers prayer. God bless you. May God keep you. I'm just going to pray a small prayer for you. May God open up your eyes of your understanding. May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. I pray that you will get a zeal for God, that you will get a hunger and a thirst after him, and that you will seek him with your whole heart. And when you do, you will find him. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, God bless you. Until next time, we're going to say shalom.